is Jorge Otero Pailos. I'm the director of the Historic Preservation Program at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. It is a great pleasure to welcome Richard Southwick, FAIA, who is a partner and director of historic preservation at the New York based architectural firm of Bayer Blinder Bell. Um, Richard is one of the great masters of historic preservation architecture, one of the great masters of adaptive reuse. Um, he has done incredible projects in New York and around the country. Many of these you all know, uh, including New York City uh, Hall, the US Capitol Infrastructure Master Plan. He also worked at Columbia University doing the master plan early on in his career. We can talk about that later. He worked at Greenwood Cemeteries doing their facilities master plan there as well, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, Ellis Island Museum, the National Museum of Immigration. Uh, the list goes on. Uh, he also worked in the Red Star Land Museum of Migration in Antwerp, Belgium, a really interesting museum uh, about migration um, that is so such an important topic today in light of what migrations are happening around the world. Um, Richard uh, has distinguished himself by really working on the qualities of historic design, materials, and craftsmanship and, bring, craftsmanship and bringing them forward as the basis of his design and dedicated really his career to finding new life for older structures. Now, Richard uh, also uh, graduated from a GSAP um, in 1978. So it is a great pleasure to welcome Richard back home uh, for this lecture. So thank you, Richard, for joining us. It is a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you, Jorge. Uh, and good evening, everyone. I'm really glad to be speaking to the uh, Historic Preservation Group at Columbia University. As Jorge said, uh, I am a graduate many years ago of the school, and I'm uh, glad to say I actually had James Marston Fish as one of my professors uh, way back. I, I really wish I could be there in person. Uh, I've been on Zoom calls all day, and that's the last thing I want to do uh, at this point, but um, I'm really thrilled to talk about um, uh, the Saren TWA Flight Center. Um, uh, this is a project that has a lot of personal uh, relevance to me. When I came to Columbia uh, in 1978, the first building I came to see was uh, the, the Flight Center. The second building was uh, actually uh, of the same hand, the uh, uh, Ford Foundation. And uh, uh, I have professionally been involved with the project since uh, 1995. So uh, uh, its uh, evolution is uh, uh, one that's been a, a great highlight of my career. Um, the TWA uh, Flight Center uh, arguably is one of the most significant and uh, recognized mid-century modernist buildings. Uh, it's a symbol of uh, uh, a symbol of post-war optimism, a symbol of the new coming jet age, uh, very expressive, very sculptural on the exterior and also on the interior. Um, uh, some say that uh, it uh, uh, looks like a bird in flight, but um, Saarinen never admitted to that, but it's uh, uh, an incredibly unique and creative building. Uh, what I want to talk about today is really the 60-year history, and ironically, of that 60-year history, almost two decades of it, it had been vacant, and uh, uh, the lights were out, and uh, uh, a big part of that story is how we got the lights back on. Uh, the Flight Center opened in 1962. Um, uh, shortly after its 30th anniversary, it became a New York City uh, designated structure or landmark which is as early as it, uh, that can happen. Uh, the building was vacated uh, in 2002. I'll talk a lot more about that. Went through two phases of uh, restoration, uh, one for the Port Authority of New York and the second for the designated hotel developer and finally opened uh, about a year and a half ago and uh, is in fact open for business today. So, um, what I, uh, I want to give you a little bit of the legacy and the significance of the building first, and then we'll talk about uh, 
how it's changed over time. Uh, the flight center was designed by Eero Saarinen in the late 1950s. Uh, unfortunately, he died in 1961. He never saw its opening. Um, he had a very, very short but distinguished career. He only worked uh, in any uh, uh, measure of prominence for a little bit more than a decade. He won the St. Louis Arch competition, beating out his father, in fact. And that was in 1948 and uh, ended up... Uh, dying very suddenly in 1961, uh, diagnosed with a brain tumor and was dead within a month. Um, he was a great collaborator. Uh, uh, on this project, he worked with uh, Raymond Lowy, uh, Charles Eames, Lawrence Knowles, and we'll look at some of that work uh, a little bit later. Um, the uh, TWA Flight Center is located at what had been Idlewild uh, Airport, now JFK International Airport. Um, in 1938, uh, Delano and Aldrich's LaGuardia Airport opened and uh, very quickly uh, everyone realized it was just way too small. Uh, uh, Delano and Aldridge did uh, a number of uh, different schemes, uh, a pinwheel scheme, a horseshoe scheme, Harrison Bromwitz did a figure eight scheme. Uh, all of these turned out to be too expensive. So the New York City Airport Authority that was uh, uh, planning the new airport came up with another idea called uh, Terminal City. And this is the master plan of that. And it was masterful for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we're in the, the post-war era where each of the airlines wanted to develop and promote their own uh, brand identity. Uh, but more importantly for the authority, each air, airline pay, designed and paid for their own terminal. Therefore, the authority did not have to pay for it. They did the infrastructure and the airlines each did the, uh, the terminal design and construction. Uh, TWA had arguably the most important site. Uh, the red arrow shows uh, it being on the end of a long uh, roadway access. Uh, uh, SOM's uh, large H shape just to the left of that was the international terminal. And on the other side of international terminal was the Pan Am terminal. Uh, those are the two prominent uh, American airlines, uh, American uh, or U.S. airlines at the time. But uh, TWA uh, arguably was the most important uh, site with a very large uh, air side uh, compared to their land side frontage and a very prominent location. Uh, the uh, design uh, went forth, went on for many years through the mid to late 1950s. Um, uh, we always joke that the uh, image on the right-hand side might, in fact, be uh, Saarinen himself. Um, Saarinen and his successor firm, Roach Dinkelow, did a lot of work in large-scale models, which is really important for the type of uh, sculptural um, expression, expressionist uh, design that was being uh, uh, promoted from the office. And um, uh, uh, the, the building it, in itself got lots of... Um, uh, press and is a very highly uh, anticipated. Uh, a few things that were really important to Saarinen uh, were very analytical. Uh, how does one leave one's car in the parking lot, go through the entire process of um, getting ready to board the plane, get out and get to the seat on the plane? Uh, Saarinen, in fact, went to airports all around the country with a stopwatch and he would time that uh, procession. And his goal was to make it uh, quicker and more uh, efficient at TWA than any place designed in the United States. Uh, that was for both passengers and also baggage and material handling. You can see on this uh, uh, slide, uh, the uh, eggshell in the center, which is the terminal, tubes that go out to uh, flight uh, wings and then from there uh, to the plane itself. Looking more closely at the uh, an early rendering of the uh, the flight center, uh, it's really a flow chart right through uh, the middle of this building to the two way to the two flight tubes uh, on the left and right hand side. All of the support uh, amenities and functions were on the flanks: uh, checking in, leaving your baggage, uh, finding a, a food and beverage, a place to have a drink, or just waiting with a great view out to the tarmac. Um, so 
Uh, the design really went through many, many iterations. In fact, at one point, the tubes were uh, uh, glass enclosed uh, uh, moving walkways, which were VE'd out. It was just too expensive. But um, uh, Serena was a great innovator, a great thinker, and uh, applied a lot of those thoughts into this building. Uh, equally, um, the structural uh, gymnastics of this building were really, really impressive. Designed um, in the late 50s and early 60s, this was the time of uh, uh, great fascination with thin shell uh, structures. Um, it was a time of uh, Pierre uh, Luigi Nervi's uh, uh, George Washington Bridge uh, bus terminal, which uh, uh, opened in 1963. And uh, 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 architects and engineers are taking great advantage of the material of uh, reinforced concrete. Uh, the shell here uh, ranges from five inches to eight, 18 inches um, in section. It's really quite thin. And what's uh, incredible, uh, the roof is over an acre and a half at 65,000 square feet. The entire roof is supported on four columns. Um, each column might be the size of a Manhattan studio apartment, but four columns nonetheless. Um, I always give the uh, example of a bird with two very, very thin legs with half of the weight in the front, half of the weight behind, and it's in perfect balance. Uh, this is a close up of the uh, uh, the roof structure, there are four large concrete lobes and uh, they are in almost perfect balance. Uh, you can see at the lower right, one of the very large columns, each column or yoke supports uh, two adjacent uh, concrete lobes. And um, uh, they come together in slight compression on the back three, the two sides in the back and slight tension on the front. Uh, we have the uh, great opportunity to work with the Avatar, and we had a number of um, uh, oral histories. I think Glenn Bernazian's uh, listening in and Glenn was a, a big part of um, some of those interviews. Um, and uh, uh, this is all done pre-computer slide rules. Uh, some of the drawings we found had all the calculations on that, but a perfect balance of these four very, very large uh, pieces of concrete. Uh, there is an ongoing debate between uh, Ammon and Whitney, who's the structural engineer, and Saarinen of whether this could be one large piece of uh, expansive piece of concrete or whether it needed control joints. And you'll see the blue lines here, which are skylights, which are effectively expansion joints. Um, the overall shells uh, uh, over uh, larger than the football field is 315 feet edge to edge. And the great compromise was to add skylights, which uh, 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 introduced a lot of uh, neutralizing light within the interior and provided the, the expansion joint that the structural engineers insisted was necessary. Uh, this is probably my uh, most favorite photograph of construction um, taking place in about 1960. It was a nonstop 120 hour uh, uh, concrete pour. Uh, what I find really fascinating because the building was built uh, or designed on the cusp of the jet age. On the left hand side, you see one of the great uh, uh, prop planes of the era, the Lockheed Constellation, sat about 110 passengers. And the right hand side, a very, er a very early Boeing 707, which also sat about a, a 100, 110 passengers. And the uh, building itself was designed for passenger loads of about that size. And that becomes a bit of a problem uh, later on. So anyway, the building uh, finally opened in 1962 to great acclaim. Uh, Ada Louise Huxtable, the New York Times uh, uh, architectural critic at the time, uh, uh, stated in one of uh, the reviews, um, uh, of all the buildings proposed for Idlewild Airport, the TWA Flight Center was by far the most dubious idea, but was by far the most successful. Um, and uh, uh, Saarinen made the cover of Time Magazine. This got great press. And uh, it was uh, photographed. Ezra Stoller uh, did one of his great monographs uh, uh, just when it opened. And these are a couple of photographs. This is the 
celebrated beak, which was actually a drainage sub um, uh, for the rainwater coming off of the shells with a, a small uh, fountain at the edge of the beak. Uh, one of the interiors, and I always like to say that there's not a square corner anywhere in this building. Um, uh, part, some of the innovations, if you look on the right, uh, this was the first building to have baggage carousels. Uh, one of the ideas that uh, Sarah and uh, helped to develop. Uh, on the left, uh, one of the tubes out to the uh, uh, waiting rooms. On the right, the waiting room. And in the back, uh, the jetways we know today to get from the waiting room to the plane. This was the first building uh, which had jetways as well. So very innovative, very analytical, and very successful for a few years, but not a lot, not a long time. Uh, this is a photograph from about 1970. Uh, it's very crowded, and you see a lot of not so happy uh, passengers. Um, the uh, aviation industry just took off in the 1960s when the uh, Terminal was uh, uh, designed in 1955. There are 3.5 million passengers going through uh, New York City. By the time that um, the building opened in 1962, that 3.5 million was uh, increased to 11.5 million passengers. So uh, the building just could not accommodate the amount of uh, traffic that went through it. Uh, these are actually more current uh, photographs, but um, um, one of the real problems was that uh, the, uh, the building was really designed for that 100 person or 100 seat plane, be it the uh, Lockheed Constellation, the Boeing 707. And what was in a, uh, strong development in the late 1950s was the supersonic transport, uh, the Concorde, which also sat about 100 passengers. Um, in 1970, uh, uh, TWA brought on their first wide body jets, the Boeing 747, and that effectively um, rendered the TWA flight center obsolete. So in a way you could say it was obsolete within 10 years of opening. Um, the, uh, uh, if you look at the morphology diagrams uh, along the bottom of this slide, uh, the uh, a uh, building tried to adapt. There were additions, uh, uh, baggage uh, 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 structures, uh, larger uh, waiting rooms and the like, but uh, it could never really uh, adapt to the types of passenger loads that were uh, being experienced. Uh, when we did our research, we identified a period of significance, uh, 1962 to 1967. Those are the first two diagrams on the left. And that uh, 67 was the uh, time at which uh, Saarinen's original de design intent was uh, finally executed. Uh, and you can see all the additions beyond that all the way over to the one on the right hand side, which uh, shows when the JetBlue uh, terminal was added uh, uh, to the air side of uh, TWA. Um, TWA went through a lot of changes over the years. Uh, in 1978, um, in the Carter administration, the Airline Deregulation Act was passed. Uh, this created a lot of low cost uh, uh, competition for the major airlines. Uh, People Express uh, was, uh, if any of you remember, that was one of the, uh, uh, <coughs> Laker Airlines and others, some of the uh, airlines that started to have low cost fares that made it much harder for the TWAs and Pan Ams to survive. Uh, TWA went in and out of bankruptcy a number of times in 1992, uh, 95, and finally in 2001, um, where American Airlines uh, bought their assets and took the terminal over. Uh, after 9-11, uh, air traffic really dropped, and uh, the building was, uh, uh, in January uh, 2002, was finally um, uh, deserted and uh, vacated. So this really set the stage for uh, the next chapter in the life of the TWA uh, Flight Center, uh, really the revitalization or the post-terminal use. Um, so uh, 
Bayer Bluner Bell was brought on board to work with uh, the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey that ran uh, Kennedy Airport in 1995 as a preservation consultant. Um, and uh, we looked at uh, a number of different assignments, but uh, uh, it got uh, particularly critical once the building was uh, vacated. Uh, we looked at a, a stabilization plan to keep the building secure, uh, developed a preservation plan, and more importantly, looked at concept designs for what the building could be used if it were no longer a, a airline terminal. Uh, we looked at a conference center, a museum, uh, general aviation, or uh, in other words, a, a private uh, airline terminal, and uh, um, and finally looked at it as a uh, on airport uh, hotel. Um, and uh, that was what was decided uh, about 2005. Um, the Port Authority knew that the cost to restore the terminal uh, was beyond the pro form of any hotel developer that may come in to turn this into a hotel. So we looked at a phase one restoration, which included a number of life safety improvements. We wanted to make sure that the building was watertight and uh, uh, secure, it wouldn't degrade. Uh, did a, a, a lot of the interior uh, restoration, which is very expensive. And then uh, all that prepped it for the phase two development. And basically it, basically it um, defer, it, um, uh, uh, it deferred the costs of the, uh, the restoration. Uh, those were uh, borne by the Port Authority. So the developer later on would not need that. The uh, phase two, which uh, took place uh, about 10 years later uh, when a designated developer came on board, and this was MCR development out of New York City, uh, was to turn this building into a hotel. Uh, there were a couple um, preservation objectives that were very important. We felt that it was really important to tie the building and the flight tubes to the new JetBlue terminal. And that's what you see in the aerial photograph. So whatever use took place in the old flight center, it got backfed by the um, number of passengers going through JetBlue. JetBlue is the, uh, uh, the busiest uh, airline at Kennedy Airport. Um, and the uh, Port Authority made a commitment that this would always be the historic anchor of any new development at JFK. Um, I want to point out one other thing. If you look at the JetBlue, which is a Y-shaped uh, building uh, to the right of the image, uh, the two large flight wings uh, needed to be uh, demolished to allow JetBlue uh, to be built. And this was this was determined to be an adverse effect. So um, because uh, uh, JetBlue was, uh, um, because the TWA terminal was uh, uh, deemed eligible to be on the uh, uh, National Register, uh, this triggered a Section 106 review. Um, as we went through that, uh, there are a number of mitigations to uh, take care of the uh, uh, take care of the demolition. One was to do a full Part One and Part Two uh, National Register application. Um, uh, the next would do, was to do the uh, HABS documentation for the building. Uh, we did a partial, mostly interior, and some of the exterior restoration again to. Uh, uh, defer those costs so, so the developer would not need to uh, bear those. Um, the, uh, there was a interpretive exhibit that has been developed to tell the story of uh, JFK Airport, uh, Saarinen, and also uh, the TWA Flight Center, and particularly to uh, memorialize the parts of the buildings that were, um, that were lost. And then there's a redevelopment advisory committee that was uh, uh, set up to uh, review and advise upon the ongoing restoration. And that included uh, uh, the New York uh, State Historic Preservation Office, the, uh, uh, the FAA, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, and even the uh, Finnish consulate, um, Saarinen being a favorite son of, uh, of Finland. So uh, uh, lots of uh, parties, up to 22 consulting parties got involved with the project. Uh, any restoration project, any good architectural project starts with good, solid research. Uh, fortunately, this building was very well documented. Uh, 
Yale University had uh, an archive of all the existing drawings and correspondence. Uh, we actually found some of the uh, early drawings before they were shifted to Yale, which were at Avery Library at Columbia. Um, we were fortunate to be able to have uh, oral histories and interviews with uh, Kevin Roach, uh, with Abbott Tor from the Ammon & Whitney, uh, with Cesar Pelli. And uh, they were all uh, very insightful in terms of the development. Um, the building was very well uh, photographed uh, by uh, Ezra Stoller and a number of uh, good architectural photographers at the time. Uh, through the research, we uh, identified the uh, period of significance, which I had shown on those morphology drawings. Um, uh, so we ended up uh, starting to do a, a number of uh, uh, repairs to the building to uh, try to keep it a little bit uh, more sound and sustainable. Uh, the concrete on the two wings was in really poor shape. It had been coated about uh, 10 years earlier with a very impermeable coating. Um, and it started to trap uh, water and moisture and it's doing a lot of damage and uh, uh, destroying the concrete and uh, uh, really rusting out a lot of the rebar. So uh, a lot of this was all, uh, all repaired and reconstructed. Uh, literally you had mineral deposits uh, leaching out of this concrete and creating stalag, uh, stalagmites on the sidewalk underneath. Um, ICR did a lot of the conservation work with us. You see a, uh, a series of samples of uh, uh, how to remove that coating and uh, uh, removed it on the two wings, not on the main shell because the main shell uh, did not suffer the same damage being a much higher quality concrete. Uh, and here's a, a, a couple photographs from this shell. Uh, we did uh, non-destructive testing and uh, uh, found that uh, there's very, very little uh, damage. There was some local damage uh, where we went in and had to uh, repair some of the concrete. You see some tests of removing the, uh, the coating. Uh, on the lower left is interesting that these are the, uh, uh, the leaching of the mineral uh, deposits through the concrete. Uh, the next thing we tackled was the, uh, the curtain wall. Um, uh, this was original to the 1962 building. Uh, it was polished plate glass, um, uh, half inch thick, and it was set within uh, uh, what's known as a zipper gasket. It's a neoprene gasket, uh, which has a insert that uh, applies pressure to the glass to keep it in place. Uh, neoprene after about 50 years really started to harden. It started to fail. A lot of the glass uh, dropped and shattered. You can see on the left, um, uh, there were a number of plywood uh, uh, replacements where the glass had been uh, lost. And at one point, uh, a purple uh, solar film was put on uh, uh, much of the building. You can see that the condition of the uh, neoprene on the right-hand side. Um, there are 400 and some pieces of glass, uh, all of different sizes and shapes. Um, Right-hand side shows the, uh, uh, the very complex geometries of some of these. It was all replaced with LOF uh, green tinted glass, uh, uh, basically to match the original spec, uh, but in tempered glass. Um, and we've decided not to put a film back on, but um, uh, uh, leave the, uh, the green uh, coated or green tinted glass uh, in its original condition. Uh, there were also uh, a number of accretions that were added over the years. Um, uh, a lot of these were for new security or check-in. There were a number of these vestibules you see on the left uh, that were all removed. Uh, probably the most uh, um, uh, uh, incriminating uh, uh, addition was this uh, very extensive, very poorly placed bus shelter, which was placed right in front of the building. It uh, totally blocked the historic scene. So these are all taken out as part of the demolition of that phase one. Uh, this is a view of uh, uh, one of the restored uh, main entrances. Uh, 
we ended up uh, going back to existing shop drawings and uh, uh, Ezra Stoller photographs, uh, went back to Abbott, uh, uh, Asa Abloy, that was the original hardware manufacturer, and they were able to replicate the leather uh, door pulls on this. Uh, when JetBlue was built, um, it required a modification to the uh, two flight tubes. Uh, the uh, roadway to get to uh, the rival roadway to get to JetBlue required that the tubes be raised slightly, and the tubes, which were very important, uh, uh, landed at the new JetBlue terminal again to back feed the passengers from JetBlue into whatever use would take place in this new building. So. Uh, uh, it was basically a steel hula hoop with uh, with stucco outside, and these are uh, uh, two photographs of that construction. And two uh, 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 final photographs after it was restored: the uh, throat of the tube uh, on the south side, and then uh, a tube that where we removed the uh, industrial grade carpet. We added uh, uh, new life safety uh, to meet uh, contemporary um, building code requirements and the typical uh, 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 cherry pepper red carpet that you see throughout the building. Um, when we got involved with uh, design within the terminal itself, uh, the team sat down and we, we, uh, we do this on a lot of projects. We uh, come up with either uh, what we call design guidelines. Here we call these uh, uh, rules for the uh, restoration. And we wanted to look at um, uh, a slightly different attitude for existing construction that was being totally restored to new interventions with, uh, within the terminal that would be uh, adjacent to the existing construction. Um, the restoration was easy. It was very uh, well uh, documented. We followed the original design intent. Um, photographs were great uh, sources as well as shop drawings and contract documents. And uh, we even were able to get uh, a number of archival samples. Um, the new interventions is, uh, uh, that's the more uh, interesting part of this endeavor. Uh, we wanted to put ourselves in the mind of Serenin, but uh, distinguish the new construction from the old. And uh, we used a, a, a very similar palette of materials and even design uh, uh, concepts in terms of the cove bases and the like, but it was all a little bit more spare or refined uh, than Serenin might have done. Um, so we use this and we, we use this as a litmus test through the design. We'll go back to this uh, uh, in the middle design to make sure we're not ve uh, uh, really veering away from uh, the rules we had established in the beginning of the project. Um, one of the most important interior spaces was the uh, sunken lounge. Uh, this is the main waiting area uh, uh, right in front of the uh, large curtain wall looking out to the tarmac. Um, it had, uh, uh, we used a lot of original photographs and renderings. Um, in the 1990s, TWA was doing very well for a period and they actually uh, uh, totally covered this over from more ticket counters. Uh, when they um, took those counters out, they partially reinstalled it again with industrial gray carpeting and uh, uh, many of the seating uh, and other elements were all removed. Uh, the upper right is a, uh, uh, a very early photograph. And uh, in 2005, this, this is a photograph of what we found when we, we got involved with the phase one restoration. Uh, uh, again, using uh, shop drawings and CDs and photographs, uh, we found a, uh, uh, a diner fabricator that would do these banquette seats in Long Island City. Uh, we reconstructed the concrete substrate, uh, did all the seating, and then restored this very accurately. The uh, only change is that uh, the uh, built-in ashtrays that were uh, prevalent throughout this uh, were left out, but uh, other than that, it was uh, very, very uh, accurate uh, as a restoration. And uh, this is a, a more recent photograph uh, at the time of the opening in 2019. You can see the uh, uh, a restored uh, Lockheed Constellation, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, uh, through the windows of the curtain wall. Um, uh, earlier I'd said that there was not one square corner. Uh, the way to build a very curvilinear uh, sculpted uh, 
form like this is do a very small unit uh, uh, tile. And Saarinen used what was a fairly common material in the 1960s, it was a uh, uh, Italian uh, mosaic ceramic tile. Um, uh, they're half inch di diameter typically, uh, but over the many years, um, uh, they really degraded. These are some of the conditions we found when we moved in, uh, lots of really poor repairs or no repairs in many cases. Um, so we ended up doing a complete survey of the uh, upper and lower lobbies, the main uh, lobby space in the building. We gridded the building in 10 foot grids, photographed it and identified a whole series of uh, repairs. Um, you can see the size of the tile on the left-hand side. There's a penny. Uh, they're called penny tiles, but they're half inch in diameter. But uh, there are also thousands of, uh, uh, besides a half inch, thousands of three eighth and quarter inch tiles, which were used for uh, bending the, the grids uh, to uh, be able to do a lot of these curvilinear uh, shapes. Uh, we ordered about three and a half million pieces of this uh, for the phase one. Uh, Bear in mind, there are about 6,000 pieces per square foot and about another 10 million for phase two. Um, this is, uh, these are just some photographs of probably the most challenging portion of this. Uh, uh, this is a mock-up that ICR worked on uh, for the, uh, uh, the nosings at the stairs, uh, particularly with uh, uh, rolly bags that people use now. These were uh, subjected to a lot of uh, damage and abuse. So, uh, we looked at stainless steel anchors and epoxy-based uh, uh, mortar, and then special hand-pressed uh, nosing tiles uh, right along the edge. Um, there are uh, repairs and restoration of all types. Uh, we were able to locate a, a itinerant uh, uh, tile restoration group coming off a project in Miami. They came and worked on this project for almost a year, and uh, uh, each of the five people in the crew were certified for different types of repairs. The simplest was just a single uh, tile replacement to doing these really uh, elaborate three-dimensional curves. Uh, and in a way uh, you can see these people working, it's almost like doing dental surgery, very fine work. And um, uh, part of the key was to restore it, but never make it look brand new. Uh, this is a, a, a view of uh, the stairs. It still shows its age, its patina, um, but if you compare that to the uh, uh, couple slides ago where this was uh, totally deteriorated, um, we wanted to make sure that uh, the patina, which is a sign of its legacy, sh shown through. Uh, other than the lobby, the most important uh, public space, interior space in the building is the Ambassadors Club. Uh, this is the uh, TWA uh, First Class Lounge, and uh, uh, it's on one of, the, one of the mezzanines on the north side. You see a, a photograph when it first opened in 1962, when we started doing work on this part of the building in 2014. You can see the condition. Um, again, uh, sound research. Uh, uh, discovered that uh, this had actually gone through a number of changes in the first five years after it opened. Uh, Serenin did an original design, a, a big collaborator with, uh, with him was Charles Eames on this. Uh, at the request of TWA, uh, uh, much of it was changed a few years later and Roach Dinkaloo, the successor firm, ended up doing what you see in blue. They made a number of changes to the, uh, uh, to the lounge. So, uh, we decided to go back to the original design, which is the 1962 Saarinen uh, design. We used the uh, original uh, construction documents to inform us. Uh, the right-hand uh, uh, rendering or, or diagram is really the morphology uh, of the uh, two generations uh, overlapped. Uh, Yale University had the uh, uh, Saarinen archives and within the files, we were lucky to find uh, original sample boards. And uh, that's what you see uh, on the uh, uh, upper middle. Uh, these are tucked away for oh, probably uh, half a century, never seeing the light of day. So the colors and the fabrics were really very true. Um, uh, the image on the left uh, 
uh, again, was original. If you look through that small doorway, you see one of the Florence Knoll uh, uh, patterns or uh, wall fabrics. Uh, we were able to uh, work with Knoll and get that uh, uh, recreated. Uh, lighting's not as good on the one on the right, but um, uh, we re recreated that uh, lounge through that doorway with uh, a very similar types of uh, fabrics. So um, I really want to talk about uh, next what's outside of the terminal. Uh, uh, the terminal be became the lobby for a new hotel, but the hotel itself required a lot of new construction on this very small site. Um, interestingly, a, uh, uh, an airline terminal and a hotel lobby have very similar programs. Uh, there's check-in. Uh, there are restaurants and bars, there's waiting, and there's back of house. And uh, about the only uh, uh, only function that's not the same was the uh, the baggage handling, the big uh, uh, baggage rooms. Um, uh, the TWA Hotel uh, was the only uh, uh, on airport hotel, which really uh, uh, guarantees its, its success. Uh, there are four buildings total, uh, 505 rooms, uh, a couple very large uh, ballroom banquet halls and a number of meeting rooms and then uh, seven bars and restaurants throughout. Um, the program really considers this to be a, a full service hotel that happens to be at, on an airport. Um, much of the meeting ballroom banquet functions uh, uh, occur with a very, uh, uh, very large population within five or 10 miles. Um, the fact that it's an airport hotel is a uh, uh, just one aspect of its overall program or uh, performa. Um, this is a, a rendering, um, an aero rendering of the site. Uh, uh, TWA Flight Center, the original building is really uh, dedicated to uh, the lobby functions. There are two seven story hotel buildings tucked behind outside of the two tubes. Uh, this is important so when you stand at the front of the building at the Fountain Plaza, if you will. Uh, they are basically outside of the historic scene. Um, and we've left the area in the center between the two tubes uh, open. Um, uh, you see the Connie, that's the a restored uh, Lockheed Constellation. But more importantly, underneath that is a 46,000 underground uh, event space. Uh, to get from the terminal to the other buildings uh, was a bit of a challenge. Uh, we did not want to have a tube from the terminal directly to the hotels. We really did not want to go underground. So we went back to uh, Saarinen's original circulation. Uh, the tubes are always the way to get people to the planes. We decided to intercept that at midpoint and we added uh, these 10 foot really like glass bridges from the tubes to the hotels. Um, and once you enter the hotel, the, the red rectangles are the uh, elevator and stair cores. Um, the bridges are cantilevered from the concrete, concrete structure of the hotels and they touch the tube very lightly. I say they, they kiss the tube and we've just basically just opened a, uh, 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 opening within the tube to be able to uh, transfer from the tube to the hotels. Um, on the left, once you get to the uh, core on that uh, left or north hotel, you then uh, extend down a very large uh, grand stair to the conference center as well. So how do we find the room for the two hotels in a very constricted site? Um, these few diagrams show um, the uh, uh, the site condition when the work started in, in 2014, if you remember the morphology diagram, there are uh, additions that were added uh, throughout the building, uh, including on the two wings, and that uh, extended uh, the building much closer to JetBlue. Um, the first move was to uh, go back to the original footprint, restore the 1962 terminal, and that removed what we call the bat wings, or these two large extensions. And that created the real estate for the two blue boxes on, that you see on the, uh, uh, the 2019 uh, portion of the slide. Um, uh, these follow the curve of the, uh, the roadway, the curve of the terminal, and they meet all the New York City uh, uh, setback uh, requirements as well. 
uh, left hand slide is the scar tissue uh, where the uh, the bat wing or the addition was taken off. And the right hand slide, uh, uh, which is really fascinating, was taking a whole large part of the program and putting it underground to not block the view out of the, the flight terminal. And this is an excavation that went down 30 feet uh, below grade. Uh, the hotel design um, needed to do two things, not only provide rooms, but also to provide this very neutral backdrop to the sculptural, uh, uh, the sculptural snare and flight center in the, in the, uh, uh, the foreground. Uh, when JetBlue was built and the air train walkways were all built, uh, there's an incredible amount of visual clutter uh, behind the terminals. So uh, uh, one of the functions of the seven story uh, hotel wings was to block all that out and provide uh, a neutral gray background. So the, uh, uh, the hotel really, the uh, uh, flight center really just shown in the foreground. Uh, the uh, curtain wall for the uh, hotel um, followed the same curve, uh, it's segmented. Uh, the biggest challenge here was that uh, particularly in the south building, it was very, very close to uh, one of the taxiways for uh, the major international uh, A380s, new wide bodies coming in. So uh, working with Ceramic Acoustics uh, in their acoustic labs, we developed a uh, a very unique curtain wall, uh, almost five inches thick, seven panes or lights of glass, triple glazed, and it was fine tuned uh, to be able to block out both those really low rumbling, uh, low frequency sounds of a jet engine taking off and the really high squeaky sounds of a truck brake as a truck's backing up. So we looked at many, many uh, different variations, again, all computer generated, and came up with uh, the design that you see on the right. Uh, these are two images, uh, one of the curtain wall following the, uh, the curve of the uh, TWA Flight Center and one of the suites in the hotel uh, with a great view overlooking uh, the Flight Center itself. Uh, uh, here's the lobby plan. Um, where uh, similar to Saarinen's flow chart, this really works the same way. You come right up through the center of the building, check in on the left-hand side, which is the international check-in now for hotels, a uh, food hall on the right side, which was the domestic check-in. The sunken lounge is still a waiting area. And then you go out to the two tubes and uh, work your way to the hotels. Uh, a before and after, uh, a serenin view on the upper left of the check-in counters uh, in much worse shape in 2014, uh, lower left, and then restored for the hotel check-in on the right-hand side. Uh, the old baggage um, retrieval hall, the baggage hall was probably a, one of the more <coughs> interesting parts of design. Um, it was the, other than the, lot, the main lobby itself, it was the only long span space in the two wings. And uh, it was a long span to be able to get all the baggage hair cells in without uh, 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 columns in the center of the space. Uh, and uh, again, the baggage handling was, was about the only function that uh, was not required for the hotel. So this was uh, adaptively reused into a new ballroom. And uh, the long span of the structure was very important for that. And if you notice the lights, uh, uh, very uh, uh, Breyer-esque, uh, very similar to the lights at the uh, uh, Breyer's uh, Whitney uh, Museum. And that was a, uh, one of the interpretive uh, designs that you'll see in a number of places uh, throughout the building. Uh, here's a view from the uh, front door of the cascading steps uh, all the way out to the tarmac uh, where you see NYC. That's a uh, uh, restored uh, split flap uh, uh, information board by uh, Solari out of uh, Italy. These are originals from the building. And uh, uh, we uh, fortunately took a, a, a side trip to uh, uh, Udine, Italy outside of Venice and we were able to get these uh, 
uh, pituitaries restored, and uh, uh, they're now important parts of um, uh, the uh, the uh, amenity or experience of the uh, of the guests. Uh, two other views of the interior. Um, now let's go downstairs for just a minute. Um, uh, the event space, the event center, or the conference center is a very important part of the program. And this is what draws in not only people from the airport, but uh, people from New York and people from the, uh, the region. Um, the uh, event space is 30 feet below grade. There's one large uh, 7,000 square foot uh, ballroom and about 40 uh, different meeting rooms of various sizes. This is particularly challenging because it was 30 feet below grade and uh, um, Kennedy Airport was basically built in a marsh. The water table is eight feet below grade. So uh, similar to World Trade Center, this is uh, built as a bathtub. And because it's a very large open volume, um, it tends to float. So it's built on tiles. Uh, the piles are actually tie down piles and they're adjusted to keep the building down rather than to support it up. Um, so uh, it doesn't float uh, from the buoyancy of the water pressure. Uh, this is the pre-function space. Uh, long linear space lighting is very important in the design. You see, uh, again, similarly, these uh, uh, very large circular uh, lights, the luminous ceilings. Uh, we wanted to provide as much ambient lighting throughout to uh, dissuade the uh, the visitor uh, from the idea that he's 30 feet below or three stories below grade. Uh, you can actually see some of the interpretive exhibits that were required by the, uh, uh, the section 106 uh, mitigation in uh, a number of these niches as well. Uh, this is that large ballroom, uh, can be subdivided into three spaces and uh, hold up to uh, a thousand people overall. The clear story uh, light again, gives the uh, sense that you're above grade rather than three stories below grade. Um, there are cocktail lounges throughout uh, the project as there are many uh, airline terminals, but uh, probably the most interesting one was this 1958 uh, Lockheed Constellation. Uh, this is uh, very significant to the project. It, uh, Howard Hughes owned TWA for many years and he conceived this uh, plane. It was the first plane that could fly cross country without stopping. And uh, uh, the importance there not only was it, it was a little, bit, uh, a, a little bit of a shorter flight, but it allowed the airline to do one crew rather than two. So it was much less, uh, much more cost efficient. So, uh, Tyler Morris, the um, uh, developer, was able to um, get the, uh, purchase one of these from Lufthansa Airlines, who's restoring another one and cannibalized a lot of the parts out of this plane uh, for one they wanted to make airworthy. And we were able to uh, basically bring this thing up to code, restore it, and bring it down to New York. And this is it being uh, hoisted into position and turned it into a, a just this incredibly interesting uh, cocktail lounge. We used a lot of the uh, old advertising um, photographs and images uh, as an inspiration for the new interiors. Uh, one of the last slides of the, uh, the new construction uh, uh, is of the rooftop of uh, one of the, the two hotel buildings. The other roof is a uh, uh, fully self-contained code generation plant. This building is off grid and uh, it produces all of its power through natural gas on its own uh, power plant. But uh, this is a South Hotel with a view overlooking the Bay Runway and you're very, very close to uh, the planes coming into the International Terminal. And it's a curved uh, spa. It's a, a pool heated to 95 degrees all year long and uh, a small lounge on top of um, the South Building um, and uh, open uh, uh, 365 days a year. So I wanted to talk a bit about what's next um, for TWA. Um, the building opened in uh, 
May of 2019. It's been a tough year because of COVID, but um, um, they are uh, operating, their uh, um, occupancy counts are increasing. Um, but uh, if we go back historically, uh, we talked about Terminal City. Uh, TWA was the last of the Terminal City uh, buildings uh, to be completed. Uh, you can see it in red. You see SOM's big international terminal next to that, and then TAM's uh, uh, Pan Am on the opposite side of international, the international terminal. Actually, next to TWA was uh, IMPA's national terminal. Uh, those three, uh, National, TWA, and Pan Am, were all deemed eligible to be listed on the National Register. Um, TWA was the only one that survived. And in the master plan uh, that Port Authority put forth in the mid 1990s uh, called JFK 2000, uh, uh, they planned to keep TWA, and you see the JetBlue uh, array behind it. But uh, uh, all of the fewer terminals now, and each of those got larger. And uh, uh, this plan is basically executed to some form similar to this. And then uh, uh, Governor Cuomo, a couple of years ago, if you recall, came out with uh, the new JFK plan, uh, JFK uh, 2025. Um, and again, uh, it, the terminals get larger and uh, uh, a smaller number. There are two large clamshells, uh, uh, which are these two big mega terminals. But again, on the end of the axis, if you look at the lower right hand of uh, uh, this image, uh, the TWA terminal still becomes the uh, this historic uh, keystone or anchor uh, uh, for the airport. Uh, and this is now development. And uh, in a way, the, the fact that JetBlue was built behind TWA made the TWA site obsolete for anything uh, airline related. So the hotel became a very uh, useful um, uh, a function for that space. And uh, uh, it now be again becomes the uh, main focus of the airport. So um, I wanna thank you for the last uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, as um, Saarinen was a great collaborator with uh, a number of other designers, so was BBB on this. I just want to uh, give uh, uh, recognition to some of the other designers that worked with us. Uh, uh, Liberano Chiavera Architects uh, was the uh, uh, hotel architect and uh, uh, worked on some of the uh, concepts of the uh, site plan. Uh, Inc. Architects uh, did all the uh, interior design for the event spaces. Stonehill Teller the interior design for the hotels. And uh, Matthews Nielsen uh, was a landscape architect. And uh, uh, for me, it's been a 25 year um, uh, role on this project. And I'm thrilled it's finally uh, open for business. As you all know, a vacant historic building is a dead building. And um, um, uh, we're thrilled that this finally uh, came to fruition. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Well, I, I'm the official clapper. Of, of, uh, of, of, so thank you so much. It was really a, a, a terrific talk. Um, for those of you that would like to ask some questions, please do put them in in the chat and I will read them off uh, to, um, to Richard uh, as we go. Um, as you think about your questions, uh, we'll, we'll spend maybe the next uh, 20, 15, 20 minutes uh, in Q&A. Um, Richard, I wanted to start off by asking you about this, how do you hold a team this large focused together? Um, you know, you mentioned all of the people that were involved in this. Um, and you talked about the, the, the way that you work with these design guidelines, the principles that you, that you um, abide by when you create rules for how do you restore, how do you intervene? Can you tell us a little bit more about those guidelines and how do they actually work during the, during the design process? Do, they, do you find yourself going back to them often or having to you know, uh, bring the team or to discuss the guidelines? Because um, of course, guidelines can be interpreted so how do, and, and, and that's our purpose, but how do you, how does that happen um, 
does did this happen? Did this seems like the outcome in this project was particularly successful? Was there something about the process that was different than other projects, or uh, or have you now perfected this this process of of how do you work with the team? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I, th I think the team structure is fairly unique for us. We've rarely worked with as many design partners and uh, also a developer that had a very strong vision for the site. But the idea of having uh, design guidelines or principles, uh, and we established those very early on, uh, is uh, a commonality to all of our design uh, projects. Um, we sit down with some of the, the key people in the firm and we hash out, we talk through the project at the beginning. I use it as a litmus test. We go back and then every phase or even more, um, more frequently and uh, are we being true to the guidelines that we established? Um, you know, guidelines are not, you know, uh, uh, cast in stone. Uh, they, they are open to interpretation. They might be able to be changed throughout but they tend to be fundamentally sound. Um, you know, it's understanding the character defining features of a building. It's understanding um, uh, what the original design intent might've been and then using good preservation principles as we, um, we debate how you intervene in the original building. Um, I strongly believe, and I, I, think, I think we've talked about this in the past, but many of our clients come to us and they, they believe a building can't be changed. It's a landmark, it's, it's uh, cast in stone. And I always say, no, that's not true. Uh, the best buildings throughout history have long lives and um, a change needs to be appropriate. It needs to, um, uh, it needs not to overwhelm the original concept of the building. And, um, but it, you know, if you look at the image on the screen right now, if you still see this is an image from opening night. Uh, this is certainly not what Saarinen envisioned, but conceptually, if you look at the main views out through the main curtain wall, we try to recreate um, a view that um, uh, went out to the sky and the airline, so to the uh, airfield. Uh, I didn't show you a detail, but we very, carefully designed a warped plane, which blocked out all of the automobile traffic on the other side of that tarmac. So you saw the upper part of JetBlue and you saw the sky, but you wouldn't see any of the roadways. Um, you know, we're really conscious of uh, what's important in a project. We keep going back to testing that. In light of that, I, I wanted to ask you about the section 106 review and the, the, the uh, adverse effect mitigation techniques that uh, you mentioned, one of them being this notion of the interpretive exhibits, which I find wonderful as one walks throughout the, the terminal, there's all these moments in which you're uh, kind of creating these, these, um, these scenes almost in which you, you discover about the history of TWA or the history of Saarinen's involvement with the building. Um, tell us how that came about, um, how your decision to, to to mitigate for one ad adverse effect came came to the solution of interpretive exhibits. It's 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 not a direct causality. I mean, how did how did that discussion go, and how did you come up? Uh, with it? It, it actually started with another airport project I worked on um, around the year two thousand. A, a really uh, important but much less known uh, building at New York Airport from nineteen thirty five and. Uh, we actually suggested that to the New Jersey SHPO that uh, um, uh, for what was being lost, how do we memorialize that? How do we tell the story? And um, uh, when we got to literally it was a three to four year ultimate negotiation with SHPO and FAA and everyone else, um, one of the things we offered very quickly is you're losing part of the original building. You'll never be able to understand this building as Saarinen, uh, uh, originally envisioned it because it's a, a it's a brand new world now. How can you tell that story of uh, the uh, JF the Kennedy Airport evolution TWA and the importance of Serenade? And, and uh, uh, it's a little bit different here because um, it's scattered throughout the building. And I I, I find that actually uh, fascinating. There's a uh, a story about Serenade, which is a uh, basically replicated uh, Bloomfield Hills. Uh, 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 architect's office, 
at the end of one of the tubes. And there's another thing on Howard Hughes. There's another thing on uh, just the whole evolution of the TWA airline. Um, you know, in all of these, there are dozens of stories. We actually worked with the New York Historical Society early on to help develop the stories. So uh, again, a, a, another one of the many, many uh, uh, designers that work with us. There, there is a paradox in this project, isn't there, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of airport design, because so many airports are designed to be flexible and expandable, and then they somehow cannot fulfill that uh, expandability and end up getting torn down. You showed us the. The, uh, the, the various plans for the future of JFK. And yet this building is notorious for not being expandable. And it seems to be the only one that has survived um, or will survive all of these expansions. Yeah, really good question. Uh, Saarinen, when he was designing this, uh, and again, a great analytical uh, problem solver, uh, also designed Dulles Airport uh, outside of Washington. And if you know Dulles, which is the uh, extruded flight wing, um, Dulles was expanded about 15 years ago. It was almost doubled in size by um, expanding that extrusion, uh, which gave it much more capacity. Um, and, and that one did not use the, uh, the tubes or the, the jet, uh, um, the jetways uh, there. They still use a, a, a series of uh, mobile, what they call mobile lounges, where you actually take a bus out to the plane. Um, but that one actually survived and was able to be expanded. Um, this building, because it's unique geometry uh, and form, uh, just uh, that could never happen. Perkins and Will in the 1990s did a big underground expansion, basically where the uh, uh, conference center is. Uh, it was never executed, but uh, uh, they also saw how difficult it was to expand this. So um, uh, what I was saying a little bit earlier, when JetBlue was built, this piece of property became absolutely useless as an airline terminal. And the fact that it's useless as an airline terminal uh, basically guaranteed its long-term survival. Uh, when we got involved with the project first in 1995, uh, the building was uh, just um, listed on the New York City uh, landmarks, uh, um, uh, uh, listed as a New York City landmark. Uh, Port Authority called me in uh, from our preservation experience and said, uh, you know, can we tear it down? Uh, Port Authority has what they uh, consider a, a superior jurisdiction. So it could have been demolished, um, but we all came collectively to the uh, understanding that no one wanted to, uh, no one wanted to hold the sledgehammer to tear this building down. It was too important. Um, so, um, you know, very quickly they realized that uh, this building uh, had a legacy, and it, it really was the story of JFK. Um, a, a, a really tragic story, uh, uh, which was important for this building. Neil Levin. I don't know if you remember that name. Neil Levin was the uh, uh, the uh, chairperson of the Port Authority who died in 9-11. And uh, three days before that, we toured uh, Kennedy Airport and TWA with Neil Levin, and he was going to identify this as the keystone of that uh, JFK 2000 plan. And uh, uh, the New York Times was going to have a, a, a big article, um, which would have been the Sunday after the Tuesday of 9-11. Of course, none of that came to pass. But um, uh, the torch was passed. I mean, there are other developer, development people at the Port Authority who I've always considered born again preservationists. They quickly understood how important this building was, even to the point of doing some things in the restoration that were VE'd out, value engineered out during the original construction. Uh, we did the, uh, the gasketing the right way. We did a couple of the other the, uh, curtain wall the right way when uh, it was never done. Uh, fully correctly, uh, first time around. Uh, there's a question here uh, from Katie Angen in the audience that dovetails into uh, what you were just talking about. She's asking, what were the biggest construction obstacles when it came to the restoration and intervention? Uh, there are really two. One, uh, the insistence that this building built in the 1938 code, building code, 
meet the 2014 building code in terms of uh, exiting and life safety and sprinklers and fire protection, all that. And um, we had about a three year negotiation with uh, the Port Authority to prove that this building was safer than ever after we were done. And then the other was to um, building the, build the event space uh, 30 feet below grade and keep it down there. I, I talk about these tie down uh, columns. Um, it's all built to uh, current seismic uh, codes. So every joint 30 feet down had to be loose enough for a seismic event, but solid enough to keep that water pressure out. Um, you know, those are things you don't even think about. Um, probably the, uh, uh, the restoration challenge was how far do you restore something uh, so it looks restored but not new? And I wanna just give a little sidebar example. Uh, years ago, we did the, main, the restoration of the main building at Ellis Island and uh, uh, successful project. I would say there was a fault to that. It was over restored. You talked about the Red Star and that was the, muse the uh, National Museum of Immigration. Um, 20 years later, we did the uh, uh, Museum of Migration or Emigration from Antwerp, the Red Star Line Museum. And there we purposely did not restore to the same extent. We wanted it to show its age. And, uh, you know, that's one of the uh, more mature lessons you learn through experience, you know, how far to take something. And, uh, you know, a lot of it's really subtle and nuanced. And, uh, you know, we had a, a, a great team. Um, uh, uh, between our conservator and some of the people on staff uh, at BBB. We had a great team that really got that. They really understood it. Let me, let me ask you a little bit to, to expand on that because there were some important architects that worked on this building afterwards, like Roche and Dinkelow, which were the inheritors of the, of the mm -hmm. Saren and firm, but you decided to remove those pieces out, right? Uh, yeah, there are a couple areas. One, um, when we just when we uh, established the period of significance, um, we felt it was very uh, justifiable to remove any accretion built um, after that date, which was 1960, uh, 1967. And that essentially allowed the, uh, it provided the, uh, the land for the hotels to be built. Um, when we looked at the ambassador club, uh, we felt that the original design intent uh, of Saarinen and Charles Eames, who did a lot of the built-in furniture, uh, was more important than probably the coerced change of Roach Dingaloo uh, that the TWA grass, I think, uh, uh, forced upon them. Uh, uh, Warren Platner uh, worked on this project, Cesar Pelle, these are a lot of the big names from the 60s and 70s, uh, and they all passed through uh, uh, Saarinen's office. Um, Roach Dicklew, of course, being the successor firm. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, the concrete? The, the, all these figures were, were there. And, and uh, I remember speaking to Cesar Pelli about the uh, his work at the U.S. Embassy in Oslo. Um, they were working on all these projects, almost parallel processing. The concrete is such an important part of that project, also of the project in, um, in uh, London. Mm -hmm. And Saarinen had almost experimenting different kinds of concrete uh, mixes and ideas in each of these projects uh, simultaneously. The one in London was supposed to get, get dark over time with pollution, and he talked about that. And the one in Norway was a very experimental use of black concrete uh, to, to imitate labradorite. And in this mm -hmm. one, um, was it was it covered over to begin with? Was or was I mean you mentioned this? Um, it looked like an elastomeric coating that was put in at some point. Was that was that was it exposed concrete to begin with? And it then was the, the the coating was never part of the original um, uh, intent. Uh, but even before the building opened, um, it started to leak. Um, so uh, we, we found some really interesting research about how to seal this building. Um, the, uh, the building was concrete colored for many, many years and um, a, a couple of distinctive things. It's board formed. So if you look really closely, you see the, you know, 
three and four inch wide uh, boards or planks that uh, were bent to make these forms. And uh, to really um, convey the sense of concrete, it was um, uh, it, it really, uh, it, it, the natural color uh, was retained. Um, only in the late 90s um, did the port, uh, TWA, before Port Authority took over, TWA added this uh, very damaging elastomeric coating. Um, port Authority does aerial photographs of all the airports every year and uh, very high resolution. You could see uh, late 80s, early 90s, this beautiful concrete color. Um, 96 on, it was uh, painted white. And uh, we had a big debate. And um, uh, interestingly, the uh, New York State Historic Preservation Office really supported keeping the white color because it had been perceived as such for the last 25 years. Um, it's one of the things we disagreed on, but um, uh, a, a detail, not a minor detail, but uh, the, the uh, client also wanted the, the white color because that's all he knew as well. There's something very tactile about that concrete. And in general, the whole project seems so experiential. And this is, um, I imagine, coming to some degree from Saarinen. But you also push the envelope in some ways, right? There is, there is music from the 1960s. There is um, a kind of theming of the, of the space. Um, how do you? What's your what's your perspective on that uh, aspect of it? Um, I, I tend not to want to be too kitschy. However, um, you walk through. I've never seen guests in a hotel as happy as they are. I mean, the soundtrack. The um, the <laughs> the operator actually has uh, actors and actresses in costume. Nineteen sixties pilots and flight attendants. Uh, the Beatles soundtrack in the background, you see people basically dancing through the space. Um, it, it really is uh, a very joyful, experiential uh, space for that. Um, but it's also one of transition. You know, you work your way through a, uh, this contemporary entryway. Um, uh, we didn't really show it in the, and I didn't talk about it in the uh, presentation, but there's a, uh, a large covered walkway that goes from the air train to a, uh, Dan Kiley esque uh, set of fountains, uh, modernist fountains uh, outside of the, the main entry. And, you know, that's all very contemporary. The uh, uh, covered walkway is, to use that architect tease, it's in dialogue with the wings. It's the same type of form, but with a fabric covering. And you're still in a very contemporary environment until you walk into the building. And then you, you know, it, it's kind of a time warp. Uh, and then you go to the tubes, you go through those uh, little 10 foot glass bridges, and then you're back into uh, a more contemporary uh, version of what might have been uh, a more modernist palette. Yes, yeah, so that, was all very, that was all very deliberate. What's the nuance between the new and the old? And I mean, you guys in the uh, preservation classes talk about that all the time, but uh, it's not trivial. <clears throat> It, it really comes through so elegantly in, in this project and also the contrast with what air travel has become, where when you go into this terminal, you really, you know, the, the, your level of tension kind of drops tremendously. Um, I wanted to ask you one last question regarding what, what you felt, uh, you know, having really developed a career as a preservation architect, um, and, and, you know, we have many students in the room that aspire to be preservation architects. You know, what would you say are the characteristics that, that define a good preservation architect or, a, or an excellent preservation architect um, versus a, a traditional new construction architect? Uh, probably threefold. You need to be informed about precedent and history. You're not always reinventing the wheel because lots of people made really good wheels before you. Uh, you need to be creative. You can't have handcuffs on where things have to be exactly as they were. And third, you need to be flexible because uh, particularly to do an adaptive reuse, um, uh, uh, you need to change buildings to make sure they can uh, have a new life. That's great, great advice. 
Thank you, Richard. Thank you for sharing your project, your knowledge, your experience with us. It's been a pleasure to have you with us in this virtual mode at, at uh, Columbia University to welcome you back uh, to, to your alma mater. Um, thank you so much. Thanks again. Well, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Terrific. And thanks to everyone for joining us for, for this talk. Good night, everyone. <laughs>